Hey guys, cool. Welcome back. We are going to wrap up chapter 11 uh, with this module 7e. Uh, so we're continuing on our discussion of research methods. Let's just go right to it. Excellent. Yeah, it's hot summer days. I thought you might appreciate a cold drink even if you only had to look at it. <laughs> All right, so in the last lecture, 7d, we talked a lot, or I did anyway, about, um, you know, Fisher especially and his sort of creation of research methods as we know them today, um, including, you know, stats and looking at the probabilities of observing something by chance, etc. Um, but, you know, with this notion of comparing experimental conditions and all that kind of stuff. Um, today, we're going to sort of talk about the other psychology, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring that together at the end. I'll make you make sense of it. But, well, let, let, let me... Let me spoiler alert, spoiler alert, go to the ending. Uh, when we go to the ending, you will hear how somebody named uh, Kronbach uh, ultimately argued at an APA convention that when it comes to research approaches, there are two different kinds of psychology that are addressing two different kinds of questions in two different kinds of ways. Um, one group uses the experimental approach that we talked about before. The other group relies much more on the correlational approach. Okay, so we'll get there. We'll get to that point of the two psychologies. We're really going to focus on this correlational approach now um, and, and in fact, beyond correlation, especially the factor analysis. The textbook talks a lot about factor analysis in this section, uh, so I want to try to make you understand it a little bit without doing any stats. Uh, to really understand it, you've got to get your hands dirty and, and do some number crunching, but, but I hope I can give you the feel of it. All right, so let's jump right into it. Okay, so... First of all, we, we're just going to start with correlations, and you guys know uh, by now, well, is that ever blurry? Holy jumpins. Um, this, this says R equals 0. 0.7, this is R equals 0. 0.3, and this is R equals 0. R equals negative 0. 0.7, negative 0. 0.3, 0. Um, so, I mean, you, you guys know correlations now. So it's, it's involved in tip, the typical correlation. You measure two attributes of something or somebody, and you ask the simple question, that is, as one of those attributes gets larger or smaller, what does the other attribute do? Does it go along with it and also get larger and smaller? If it does, we have a positive correlation. Or does it go the opposite direction? As one gets larger, this one gets smaller. And as this one gets smaller, the other one gets larger. That's a negative correlation. Um, so we can have positive correlation or negative correlation. Hey, how's that? Uh, and of course, you can you can quantify how strong that correlation is, be it zero or one. So we mentioned in the history of psychology that you know quite often things start by kind of observing some behavior and looking for correlations. And, and we've also talked about you know this temptation that when you see a correlation, to assume causation that our that our brains keep thinking about causation that's how we think about things x causes y and we keep looking for the causes of stuff uh you know why am i the way i am what who what made me who i am today what's the cause um and correlations really cannot get to causes um as i think you know well now if you want to get to causes you have to do experiments where you manipulate variables then you can tell what effect that had so you know that's the cause and what's the resulting effect Correlations can only tell you that two things have a relationship, but they don't tell you a lot of details. Um, and sometimes, you know, so, so that's one of the reasons why some people don't like correlations. The other reason is sometimes they can just be spurious too. So this is, these are fun, by the way. I'm, I'm presenting these more for fun. So, you know, most of the times in science, if you do things right and you see a correlation, it's probably real. But every now and then there's funny things that happen. Here's one of these funny things. And there's a website, I think it's called spuriouscorrelations.com or something like this. This is looking at the, the relationship between two variables. The number of people who drowned by falling in a pool and the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in. And what you see is this weird thing. They seem to track along pretty well that when Nicholas starts doing a lot of movies, a lot of people start drowning. And when he pulls back on his movies, fewer people drown. It looks like these two things are related. Um, can anybody imagine why those two things would be related? Um, no. Now, all, all this is to say is because yeah, I present this. Oh, let's do one more. Let's do one more. Here we go. U.S. spending on science, space, and technology and the number of suicides by hanging, strangulation, or suffocation. Do we really think that 
people are out there saying, I can't believe the U.S. has spent more money on space. I'm killing myself. <laughs> you know, we, we don't really see a cause, a causation between these two things. We don't think this is why people are, are committing suicide because of the U.S. spending on science. But we do see these things seem to track each other over time. Both are going up. Now, all of this to say, to bring you back to Fisher to an extent and say, hey, you know what? Sometimes things can seem to be related just by chance. You know, we don't think there's anything real in any of these correlations, but sometimes you can get relations by chance. And so just like in the experimental approach, there have been statistical methods um, created that allow you to ask, okay, I've gotten a correlation of 0 0.3. Is that significant? Is that real? And we have a way of estimating, well, what's the probability of these two things being correlated by chance alone? And then we can compare what we have to what we expect by chance. And if it's, you know, if, if what we have is less than 5% likely, given what we would expect by chance, we can say it's a real correlation. So I just want to mention this and draw that parallel that, you know, we can use the same probability stuff Fisher talked about uh, in the context of more experimental manipulations, but we can also apply it to things like correlations and people do. So you can still, you know, come to pretty clear conclusions about whether correlations, you know, real meaningful correlations are present or not. Okay. However, most of the textbook does not go on and talk about correlations. Um, it starts talking about factor analysis. So I'm actually going to jump ahead a couple characters to somebody named Thurston, and then I'm going to leave him, and then I'm going to come back to him. But I like this example to try to make you understand factor analysis. And so the idea is this. These are, Thurston um, compiled a bunch of adjectives. These are words you might use to describe somebody. Okay, um, and so you can take a look at these. These are all, you know, sort of descriptive of the person's personality or their behavior, their way of being. Um, now, imagine we asked you to think of three people in your life. Nah, no, you know, let's do it better. Let's say 20 people in your life. Uh, and one by one, you say, would I, would I you know, how, how strong would I apply this adjective to that person? Are they a persevering person? Are they a crafty person? Are they an awkward person? So for each person, you kind of say how true you think this is. Imagine a zero to one scale or something. So you give a value. Now, after you've done that for 20 people, you can do an analysis that basically says, do certain responses seem to cluster together? Are they correlated is what we're really saying. So. What I mean by it is this, if you say somebody is, let's pick something like courageous, those people you called courageous, was there other words you often used to describe them too? So not just courageous, do they tend to be headstrong, courageous people? Maybe they are. Um, do they tend to be, I'm trying to look at what else might be sort of courageous. Um, earnest, you know, like serious kind of people. Often we think of courageous people as serious. Would they be generous? Mm, I don't know. That's maybe a little different. Courageous. Let's stick with courageous. Um, Hardworking. Capable. We usually think of courageous people as capable. Um, so let's say that certain ones, and let's do, let's do just one more to give you a sense. Let's say there's some other person you said is suspicious. Those people you call suspicious, is there other, other words you often apply to them like uh, suspicious, like I can't find anything else that I apply to someone that's suspicious. Maybe pessimistic if they're suspicious all the time. Maybe they have a negative view on life. Okay, so the important thing is this. Now imagine that we apply this to everybody. Um, and we found out a bunch of people, you know, how much of each of these things they have. We might find that certain things group together. That certain characteristics all seem to... If, if one is true of a person, these ones are all true too. And, and so what people, what people would do with this analysis is say, that's a single factor. A single factor um, makes somebody hardworking and conscientious. I saw this somewhere. Conscientious, hardworking. Um, maybe stubborn. 
capable. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe these things kind of come together. And, and so we could ultimately say, you know what, there's really only, well, if we go to the big five personality, there might be only five real factors that underlie a person's personality. Um, and, you know, if they are extroverted, then they tend to fit certain ones of these. Uh, since certain ones of these are high and other ones are low, um, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of this, but I'm trying. So from this big mountain of data, you can look at how answers of various questions correlate, and you can start to assume that if, if there's a bunch of questions whose answers correlate with one another highly, then they're all really measuring the same thing. And so you can ultimately say, well, how many things are there? How many factors are there underlying all this? And so they've come to try to describe various things by how many factors underlie it. So let's let's follow that story a little bit and see if it starts to make sense. So um, it really started with Spearman. Both Spearman and a guy named Cyril Burt, we're going to meet in a moment, created factor analysis, which sounds pretty kind of cool. <laughs> but they really worked out the mathematics, you know, to go from just pairwise correlations to instead look at a, a matrix of correlations and figure out the underlying factor structure. That's how we talk about it. And so for example, in Spearman's work, he looked at how well students did in a wide range of subjects, their performance in various subjects. And he wanted to say, well, how many factors determine someone's performance? Now, I always find Spearman's work odd in context of factor analysis because people will say in the textbook will say that he said there was two factors underlying their performance. But that's not really what Spearman said. He said there's really one factor. Well, there's a G, that's the factor. But there's also a bunch of little S's. In fact, S1, S2, S3, S4. Every individual subject area has its S. So what's this SG and G and S stand for? G is general intelligence and S is specific intelligence. And so what he said is, you know what? People who are really good in French also tend to be pretty good in these other things. If you're good in one of these things, you tend to be pretty good in all of them. And if you're not good, you tend to be not good in all of them. So there is an underlying general intelligence and someone that's high on that intelligence can do well in all sorts of different contexts. However, he said, there was also specific intelligence for specific context. So for example, imagine that somebody never took a French class. If they never took a French class, they don't have any specific knowledge about how French works. They could still probably pick up French pretty quick because they have the general knowledge. But if somebody else had a lot of specific knowledge of French, then, then they're going to do better, if, you know, assuming these two individuals had the same general intelligence, but one has specific intelligence in French, that person's going to do especially well in, in, in French. And so what he said is for, to get a description of a person, we want to know their overall G, that's their overall capability, um, but then how well they're going to do in these various things will deter be determined by their overall G. If it's high, they're going to do pretty well in all of them. But then we go to their specific S's. And if there's something they have uh, some specific intelligence into, say mathematics, then they're going to do really well in that one. If there's others they don't, then they're not going to do so well. So he thought everyone's performance was a function of their general level of intelligence, G, plus these specific levels of intelligence. Okay, so he generated that with, with, with factor analysis, basically found that this one factor, G, accounted for a lot of the variability um, in people's performance. Okay, kind of cool. Um, back on the, so, he's, so we're back on the intelligence bandwagon, which is really where the factor analysis stuff kind of came in. And we're back here for a couple of reasons. One is an excuse to talk about something else in the research methods world, which is the BERT scandal, zero BERT. So, Cyril worked a lot with Spearman, um, theoretically co-developed the process for factor analysis, perhaps was the main developer, perhaps he did nothing and Spearman did it all. Depends what you believe of Bert. He was very intelligent, uh, very interested in intelligence, so he did a lot of studying on intelligence. He was really interested in the nature and nurture. Is intelligence genetically determined or is it something you can learn? Um, as I kind of implied in the specific intelligences, right? But he was actually very hard on the nature side. Uh, and he was one of the ones that really spearheaded twin studies that we now know so well. And so he looked at the G, you can use factor analysis to measure someone's G, their general intelligence. Um, 
by the way, you, they would first do a typical intelligence kind of test. That's the data you would get. And you could use that to get through factor analysis to get their G. And he basically asked questions like the following. If I found identical twins and I looked at how, if, if one twin had a high G, did the other have a high G? Uh, and, and what you find is yes. But you can say, okay, now what I want, really want to compare is identical twins who were raised together in the same family and identical twins who, for whatever reason, got raised separately. Because these guys should have the similar environment, whereas these guys have different environments. So, you know, what, what I'll see is whether environment matters that much. And he ultimately suggested it didn't matter that much. Um, whether they were raised apart or not, their correlation with each other was much higher than two brothers and sisters, two fraternal twins. Uh, and so he argued the fact that they share genetics that's why their intelligence, their G's are so much more correlated. And so he really wanted to argue that our intelligence is a function of our genetic makeup, our biological makeup that, that we inherit. Um, and there was a big, you know, sort of battle going on. And, and Bert came up with all this data, including a bunch of data after he retired, um, reporting data from a bunch of different twins that clearly seemed to show that the nature side was was right that a lot of our intelligence was inherited now here's where things get scandalous um, people started pouring through his data and they started to not trust it um, they started to see things like the exact same correlation values in different studies even though there were different numbers of participants in the study if you have different groups of participants it's very unlikely you would get the exact same correlation and the fact that he did made people think Maybe he made up this correlation. And then people started to ask, well, where did you find all these twins to begin with? How could you have found all these people? And they started you know, going through the process he said he followed, and they didn't think he could possibly have collected data from that many people. Um, they also got evidence that he was publishing under a pseudonym. He was pretending to be somebody else and publishing data that supported Cyril Burt, which looks kind of odd, right? You're pretending to be somebody else supporting yourself. Uh, and so there was this cloud around him where, and the book will go through the debate back and forth, and it's still unclear whether he was really falsifying data or faking anything. Um, but he was certainly accused of it. Uh, and, and it became a real scandal where people started to say, OMG, we thought we could just trust scientists to be completely honest and truthful about their data and, and how they got it. Um, but maybe not. And so suddenly this became a whole other level of research ethics. We already had the social psychologists, you know, getting us worried about what you can and can't do. But in the case of the Burt scandal, it was like, hey, come on, the scientist itself has a code of conduct that they must follow. And as Cyril is evidence for, if you break that code of conduct, if you were found to be lying or cheating or falsifying data, well, there was somebody at UTSC doing that when I got hired, and, and that person got fired before I was there. <laughs> so I got hired, but by the time I got there, they weren't there anymore. Universities take the falsification of data very seriously. And so this was another yet another thing in the research as people were working on methods and stuff where they started to say, okay, we need a, you know everything peer-reviewed, and we need people to really look at the research very carefully to make sure this data is trustworthy. Um, and that's largely thanks to Cyril Burt. Okay, so you'll get more of that in the, in the textbook. Okay, now, Leo, so this intelligence area, and I'm just gonna give you a taste, it's really kind of amazing. You, you know, you start with Binet and Simon, just giving you a score, an IQ score. Um, then you have um, Spearman talking about this G and S. So the G is kind of like the IQ score, but he was trying to talk about how it, how it played out in different situations where the S's started to become important. Um, Lewis Leo Thurston thought they had things all wrong, that in fact, you, a person didn't have a single intelligence, but that there were different subdomains of cognitive processing. Uh, the book keeps talking about six, but Thurston is usually identified with seven, so I don't know why the book says six. Uh, but here's the seven that I know of that he thought were distinct parts of your intellectual ability. And that a person could be high on one of these and not high on another. So he thought there were seven factors that determined your intellectual ability. And that was based on a whole factor analysis he did. Um, 
Wow. Uh, so, you know, he was arguing things like this, that, that mental prof profiles have determined. So he was in a, in a school system in Chicago and he got all these profiles for all these children and he showed all these interesting case histories. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but this is where it really kind of gets interesting. I think a boy who was a poor reader was considered a dunce by his teachers. A dunce, you know, not very intelligent. Uh, his mental profile showed that he had the highest score on space and reasoning and high scores in all other factors except the verbal factor. Uh, so that's what teachers were seeing, that he wasn't very good verbally, but they extended that to everything. And he's saying that once the teachers understood that this student was very good in various other things, they change their attitude towards him. So he really argues that a, a G, a single G, is is oversimplifying somebody. Um, you know, what do you think of your cumulative GPA? Does that oversimplify who you are? I think it does. I'd like to know about your critical thinking ability, your creative thinking ability, your communication abilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Thurston said we have to see what he called a profile. Where is somebody on all of these seven? If you really want to kind of have a sense of what they're good at or not, you have to see them across those seven. This was sort of the intelligence story. If you take an intelligence course, you'll see how the number of factors keeps changing and people keep thinking about it different. We didn't even talk about fluid and crystal intelligence. That's another conception that's here, a two-factor theory um, that, that's pretty similar to Spearman's. Uh, and so at any rate, why we're talking about this now is that factor analysis and, and correlations, these are the kinds of issues people are studying. Okay, And so to make this more general now, let's get to Cronbach and his two psychologies. So Cronbach was allowed to give a big presentation at the American Psychological Society. And what he did was he looked at a bunch of leaders in psychology and he looked at um, sort of how they did their research uh, and, and where their kind of work fit. And what he ended up saying is there are one, two, three, four, five. Well, really, there's two factors, really. And if you look at the research methods of any of these, um, you could see that they sort of fall along these two factors. So one is some researchers were much more laboratory based. Some were much more out there in the real world. Okay. Um, the laboratory based ones used a lot of experiments and, and, and that kind of lab stuff. Whereas the ones in the field used all differential studies, all, all kinds of different methods, um, much more variability. There's also people who like quantitative data versus more qualitative data, we'll call it, verbal data. Um, and, and so what he said is you can take everything that's going on and kind of cut the world along these things. And in fact, that they even go together maybe a little bit more than that with, with these two kind of going together and these two going together. So ultimately, he said, when I look at how people are doing psychology, both in terms of the kinds of questions they're asking and the methods they're using, we can kind of see two psychologies emerging. So I'm, I'm gonna try to make this point. I'm, I'm not even sure what this data is about, <laughs> which is dangerous, but let me just give you a sense. This is, this is a bunch of people before we did something to them, and this is after. So whatever we did to them, something got higher. Whatever this trait score is, it got higher. Uh, but we have two conditions here. So what we can see is this is the before, and you could have a little histogram of what the average looked like before. This is the after, and here's a little histogram of that. And so there's some psychologists that are just interested in the effect this manipulation had um, on the average human being. Notice, by the way, if we just look at these two, here's one where it's a very similar effect, but here we have more what we're gonna call individual differences. In this case, every participant got higher, every single one, by the same amount, right, which never happens. Here we have some participants, you know, getting much higher, um, some not changing much at all. So the, the effect this treatment is having is different for different people. Okay, this is what real data tends more to look like. All right, let's go through this. Nomothetic researchers, you won't find this word in your textbook. Um, I got this word from Professor Doug Bors, who uses it all the time, um, and it is the right term to use. Uh, so this is what most psychologists are. Most psychologists care about the effect some treatment has. They know that effect will be different for different people, 
but they care about the average effect. So first of all, they're focusing on aggregate data. They're not focusing on the details here. They just want to know things like means and variances across the group. That's aggregate data. You combine a bunch of data and you just get those stats. Um, they're generally interested in whether some manipulation has an effect on people on average. So if I do this to the average person, which there is no average person, so I'll do it to a bunch of people and take their average. But if I do this to the average person, what effect does this have on them? Um, and these are, you know, this is the typical experimental approach. So they try, they tend to focus on, you know, formal experiments. They tr want to establish causation. They want to say, if I do this, that happens. Um, and these differences in participation, pr participants we see here, that's something they really, really want to reduce. In fact, we call it error variance in those circumstances. We want to try to make our two groups of people and the people within those groups as similar as possible because that reduces variance and allows us to see differences across the groups more easily. So this, this fact that different people react differently is annoying to nomothetic researchers um, to some extent. There's another group of people who are doing individual differences research and for them, they are not focusing on the averages before and the averages after. They are focusing much more on individual data. Um, and they are specifically interested in why different people are different. What makes different people different? Why do they react to manipulations differently? You know, some one way, some the other. And so it's really that question, the one that these guys found annoying, that these guys find fascinating. I want to understand why some people are more intelligent than others or, or, or why intelligent people might react to this manipulation differently than less intelligent people. They almost always rely on correlational methods. So when we're looking at things like intelligence or perception, you know, individual differences, trying to understand how individuals differ, we rely on things like correlations and factor analysis. So that's why we were talking factor analysis in the, con in the context of intelligence. Um, and you know they really see these differences between the participants as the interesting thing to understand. So with all of this in hand now, um, let me sneak back here just for a sec. What Cronbach was suggesting with his two psychologies is there is almost two distinct ways people are doing psychology, each with their own set of methods um, and, and their own approaches and their own questions. Um, now, for many of you, you'll look at these and you'll say, okay, you got the experimentalists, you got the people interested in individual differences. Where'd the clinicians go? Where does Freud fit in all of this? Um, or people of that sort of texture? Well, in fact, Cronbach wasn't even talking about, he was just ignoring those people totally. He was talking about the more quantitative um, psychologists, scientists, the ones that were measuring things and realized that the correlation approach versus, you know, the experimental approach, they are both quantitative, right? They deal with numbers um, and, and statistical analysis of numbers. And so on top of all this, we also have this other distinction. So these people we've been talking about are quantitative researchers. And so they tend to be testing hypotheses. Uh, measuring and testing various things. They have very structured responses with categories. They want to keep things as clean as possible because they don't want variability in the student data. Um, the, the researcher is an un, uninvolved re observer and the results are as objective as possible and you want as many people as possible. Now, in almost every way, this differs from qualitative research. So what do we mean by qualitative research? The classic thing might be like a user group. Somebody might have identified you as somebody who uses a certain product and they might say, would you come in? Uh, we're going to have a focus group and, and we just want to get to know you guys and what you think. So let me give you a clear example of qualitative research. I, I think you guys know Peer Scholar is a product that came out of our lab. We um, are trying to get teachers to use it all over the place. Some of the things we do every now and then is have these little focus groups where we have people that are using it and we say, how are you using it? And we're not trying to test a hypothesis here. We're not trying to get really clean data. We're just curious. We want to know, what are you doing? Uh, we'll look for trends. We'll be interested if various people say things, but we're really trying to discover ideas. We're at a very general level. We, that we're there mostly to observe and kind of interpret what we're hearing. It tends to be very unstructured. We want people to say whatever they think and highlight whatever they think. 
Um, the researcher, which is what this should be, is intimately involved. Um, they're asking the questions, they're getting follow-ups. Well, what, what would you do about that? And how would that work? And typically we're dealing with a small number of people that we're getting to know in a really rich way. Whereas this is a large number of people who are giving us very specific data. So we're learning about them in a very sort of shallow way. Um, and so this doesn't have the rigor. You don't get the clarity of answers you get with quantitative research, which is why science loves quantitative research. But this has a place. And in fact, a lot of clinicians would say they, to the extent you could describe what they do as research, it is qualitative. They're dealing with humans on an individual level, on a case study kind of basis, and they're dealing with the full richness of the human being and they're listening very carefully and they're you know ultimately interacting with them and getting a sense of of how that person um, interacts with the world and how they can help them so we're going to get into humanistic psychology and then you'll see a lot of this qualitative research and you'll get a sense of it as we go um, but right now just get a sense that you know most of what we've been talking about is measuring things and looking at correlations or whatever but sometimes we're just trying to get information and we're just talking to people and interacting with them and trying to learn um, in that way okay so that's another layer okay now final thing i want to do to you <laughs> again not in the textbook um, i want to pull your head um, a little bit and say you know when you're learning things like this you sometimes feel like oh fisher figured out the right way to do experiments and the right way to come to answers to questions what I hope you're starting to see as you go through the history of psychology and one of the bigger images I hope you're starting to get is he found out a way. And yes, it is the way we embrace today. So if you go work in a lab at UTSC, they are going to have you do either an experiment or a correlational study. You know, those two approaches are most of what we do today. But that doesn't mean that that's how it will always remain. So if you look into your crystal ball, um, I just want you to kind of, kind of have this notion that history is always evolving. What we're doing is always evolving through time. And so I want to give you this with, with two examples. So let me start with my big data example. Um, I was, I was uh, on a PhD committee. It was a medical one. And the student was trying to understand how to treat a kind of cancer. And so they would do the traditional approach, which is to try to model that cancer in a, a rat. So they would take a rat and they would... I don't know how they do this, but they inject it with something or whatever, and um, they're able to make tumors grow inside the, the rat. And they hope, however they do this, that the tumors they create are like human cancer tumors. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. That's debatable. Um, then, so they create a whole bunch of rats, give a whole bunch of rats this cancer, and then they try various treatments on subgroups of rats, and they see how they do and do they do better or not so um, there was a person describing data of that sort and one of the committee members said something really fascinating they said this way you're doing things this way you're trying to get the answers do you think it's really the most efficient best and, and ethical way to do it um, and she was kind of um, explaining and, and justifying why she thought it was um, and he said what if I give you this following example to think about imagine everybody who now has cancer, every human being who now has cancer, we are able to record everything they're given. What does their doctor diagnose? What does their doctor prescribe? What kind of treatment regimen are they on? And if we can learn as much as we can about the person too, what is their genetic, um, you know, their DNA structure? What is their previous history to this, etc.? So if we got all this data about this person, and all this data about the treatment they were given, and all this data about their outcome. And if we did that for every cancer patient on the planet and put it into a big database, truth, the truth might just fall out. If we can mine that database well, we might say, you know what? Patients of this type who were given this treatment did quite well. We might not know why, right? This is just analyzing the numbers and this is just a fax. That patient with that treatment did really well. But we know that it works. Whatever that thing is works. We see it in the data. We don't need to do an experiment to tell us, you know, this treatment seems to be a good treatment. We, the experiment's been done, not as a classic experiment, not as a Fisher kind of experiment. 
um, but in a different way we've got that data and maybe it'll be the case that things like experiments go by the wayside and we have so much data on everything everybody does we can just pull the facts out of the data. We would still want to ultimately understand why that treatment works for that cancer. So we might you know, reverse engineer and try to figure out why that works theoretically. Um, but this could be a whole new approach to getting, to getting answers to things. And so the last thing I wanna say, and this is more of a teaser, you know, the world changes and data changes. And so right now, you are putting so much of yourself out there every day on social media. Um, on, on whatever platforms you use. And there are some researchers now that are saying, hey, that's a recording of behavior that's out there, grabbable and mineable. Um, we can do a bunch of research on that and never ask people into the lab um, and, and you know, do all sorts of weird things with social media. So, so there's a bunch of cool things people are doing and sometimes these involve very different approaches, looking at what's popular on Twitter. Uh, and so it becomes new analyses. You know, I said, hey, Spearman invented um, factor analysis. You might invent some Twitter analysis. Um, you know, when people see the data and they think, how can I get an answer to a question out of that? They figure it out. So all of this to say the world keeps changing, sources of data keep changing, availability of data keeps changing. And with that, so too will research methods change. And so too will analyses techniques change. Um, so, you know, just think of these things as more living and organic than you might have before this course. I, I hope you do anyway. Okay, that's it for chapter 11. Um, and for module seven, um, I will see you in module eight. Later, guys. Bye-bye.